lot of these, um, we had, um, in, in our hospital, we had neurosurgery, of course, or neurology, and our neurologists were the ones that came. And you know how you have the fluoro, the, um, the, your radiologist, I'm assuming, inserts the needle under with fluoro, yeah. right? Okay, these doctors did not use fluoro. In fact, the first time I, th I saw that, I was like, what are they doing? Our doctors would come in, and our patient would be on the side, so they're in the left lateral um, position. And the doctor would come go for the iliac crest. They would, you know, feel and insert that needle, pop it in, and we'd turn on the fluoro and start going. I mean, when you do A to day, you get, good, you get right? pretty good at it, right? <laughs> and we had four rooms with a common area, and we would all be set up. We were like little soldiers outside our room. Our tray set up, our patients on the table, left lateral. And um, we'd stand there and the doctor would come in, put that needle in, do the fluoro, go to the next room, put that needle in, do the fluoro, and then I'd be done. They'd check the images and then get that patient sent away and get the next patient in there and then they would do it all again. That's what we did all afternoon, arth arthrography and myelography. And so, so they were very good. Now a radiologist isn't, you know, maybe doing as many of those and now, you know, uh, I can see where they would want fluoro guided um, insertion of the, the needle. So a couple ways: um, left lateral, uh, decubitus on their side, prone <coughs> or sitting. So there's a couple ways, and it sounds like a lot of your doctors and the ones. Um, and again, I was back in Texas, so it looks. It sounds like a lot of your doctors are doing them with, their, with them prone. And you've got to get um, the back arch. The key to all of this is arching the back because you have your spinous processes, right, coming off your lumbar area. Now, the spinous processes off the lumbar area are a little bit better um, because they tend to be more <laughs> horizontal. Your T-spine spinous processes are like this. You know, so with the lumbar spine spinous processes sticking out, you arch the back and it opens them up so that they can get the needle through that area and not hit the spinous process. So any one of these, it doesn't matter. They need to have that back arched. The skin is prepped. Um, did they use xylocaine? Did they insert xylocaine? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they, my doctors, again, they didn't do that because it's like, okay, well, now you're sticking the patient twice. Once for the xylocaine, that hurts, and then once for the needle that they don't feel. So a lot of times they would skip the xylocaine and just put it right in. Um, but typically we use the xylocaine and then the spinal needle is inserted and I try not to ever let my patients see those because they're long and scary looking. Um, again, where is the spinal needle um, inserted? It's going to be post, uh, inferior, inferior to L1, okay, because of the spinal cord. But where are most, where do you think most problems occur in the lower spine? L1. L. What do you do for your uh, lumbar spine x-rays? Oh, oh L5 S1? Your L5 S1 is a very common area for problems to occur. So that's why three and four, you don't want to put the needle in the area of concern because then you may not be able to, to see, you know, anything wrong with the needle superimposing that area. So we want to go either above or below the area of concern. So usually three, L3 or four, um, some of the cerebral spinal fluid is withdrawn, right? Do they put them in the um, test tubes? Mm -hmm. And then send them off to lab? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so you take some of that, uh, the doctor will take some of that cerebral spinal fluid. Do you run it to lab? Uh, we already have like a specific bag and we insert everything and then our lab collect next one. Okay, so, um, what about the rest of you? Yeah, we take it to the lab. Take it to the lab. Um, usually we take it to the lab fairly quickly because cerebral spinal fluid starts breaking down pretty fast. And so they're probably in a special bag or special coated <coughs> something. Do you have to let the lab people know that I've got cerebral spinal fluid? Do you call it to anybody's attention? I don't know. Or do you just take it over there in the bag and set it somewhere? I mean, we let them know what it is. Yeah, I mean, we let them know what it is. I mean, I, 
I had to go back, you know, we didn't have color or anything or little bags or anything. We just took them over there and we'd, we'd wrap the, um, the, Yes, or what do you call it? The prescription or what test we wanted done. It was on a piece of paper, and the doctor would write what test they wanted done on the cerebral spinal fluid. And we would get a rubber band, put it around there, take it over there, run it over there right then, and yell out to the back of the, you know, to the lab, spinal fluid! <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we have spinal fluid here, so that they would know to start testing it immediately. So they need to, it does break down quickly. So if it sits there and it's forgotten about, what are you going to have to do? Again. That's right. So you, we don't want to have that mistake. So it is removed, sent to the lab, and then contrast media is instilled into the um, spinal cord. Um, tell me about the needle. Do they leave it in or take it out? Take it out right after they inject? In or out? Out? Okay. Um, when we had to use, when we used oily contrast media, what did I tell you about that? We had to withdraw it afterwards because it stays in the spinal cord for so long. It's a slow <coughs> absorption rate. So we had to leave our needles in. With um, the non-ionic contrast media, you, the needle can be taken out. Um, some doctors do and some don't. Probably your older doctors <laughs> will leave it in because that's what they're used to from the previous contrast media and your newer doctors probably just go ahead and take it out. I always worry, what if they want more contrast media in there? I guess they better figure that out before they pull it, mm -hmm. take it out. One thing, if it is left in, now they have a needle sticking out of their back, you have the fluoro tower over and so you need to make sure that that needle is, doesn't hit it or that with the patient moving, you uh, keep an eye on the, on the needle sticking out of the back if that's the case. So a lot of time, it sounds like it's removed, so that's a good thing. And then here's um, a myelogram tray. Um, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, puncture method, this is probably like your patient. See, there's gonna be something underneath the right, <coughs> underneath their stomach to get that arching of the lower back so that they can insert, open up the spinous processes and insert the needle. Um, so that may be one way. Here's another one with them sitting upright. I've seen them all different. I've seen them all different ways. Um, so again, with the patient bent over so that um, their spinous processes are open. And then here's the way that I was used to it. This is kind of a goofy picture. I'm used to the, the head would be at the other end. But um, the patient um, on their left side with maybe a pillow or whatever, their <coughs> knees drawn up to their chest area again to um, arch the back. And then the needle is inserted um, in between the spinous um, processes into the subarachnoids. So the area is prepped. I don't know how your um, radiologist preps. Um, is it your radiologist or do your techs do it? Radiologist. Okay. Um, that's how, that's how um, mine was too. The, the um, radiologist or the neurologist would do the prep right before the needle insertion. And you know how to do a proper prep? Concentric circles. Yeah, you're supposed to start in the middle yeah, and go to the outside. So, and this is um, this is what happens with all <laughs> traps. If you, when you go to surgery, you'll see yeah, this also. Yeah, <laughs> cover it all. Okay, so so what did you do? I just went like this. <laughs> That's, That's what exactly what I'm about to do. You yeah. just tuck to my yeah. under. That's what they okay. do. You're supposed to start in the middle and use friction. You know, you put it in the bed of dying. You know, kind of get the excess betadine off and then go in a circle, in a much bigger circle. I think they say like 10 to 12 inches. No, who measures? Nobody. Um, go in a circle. So you're prepping a much larger area than the needle stick. I mean, the needle stick is even going to be smaller than that. Then they throw this away. I've had them, I bring the trash can right there and they'll go like that and miss. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then they get the next one, dip it and do it again three times. But that's the proper way to prep. Mine did the same thing, dip. <laughs> you lost your needle stick. Uh -huh. And it, it's just like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, who am I? I'm not gonna argue, so whatever, how are they gonna do it, it's fine. And so they prep the area and then um, they have a drape. Do they use, your, do they use the drape? Yes. yes. Okay, interesting, okay. 
Um, <laughs> and that's fine, not a problem, but when you put the scrape on that, you know what, that's probably the difference. Mine didn't because they were on their side. They were It'd on fall their off, side basically. Too. Yeah. When they're flat, okay, so you have a drape right with a hole in it. Is this pretty much what you have? And then you have the sticky thing. So when you are, plate, you place the drape onto the patient. You don't put it on and then move it. Why? You're right, you're contaminating from the area that wasn't prepped. So, you know, make sure that you um, you place it on there with that sticky thing off and the uh, area of interest is in the middle of that. So just be careful about, once you put it on there, you can't be dragging it too much. Okay, um, so that's, um, I'm trying to think of where I might have some issues. Oh, and then, and then there's a spinal needle on here. Look at this sucker. Look how long that is. So there's a spinal needle on here. Do your radiologists use this spinal needle that's on the tray? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she asked for a longer one. Yeah. They, I have, in my whole entire career of doing these, I've never seen a doctor use the needle that was on the tray. Ever. Ever. Uh, somebody may. I've just not have ever seen that. So usually there's some other spinal needle that they want. So here's what would happen to me. So I go find that spinal needle. And you know how you pull back the wrapping and you drop it on there? Okay, here's me. <coughs> I didn't do it. I was, oh, well, that would be, it would be like, I remember one time I, I did that and it went boom, boom. I went. And I don't know why I stand there. <laughs> I mean, like, one. that's going to change yeah. with me staring at it longer? <laughs> what do you do? You pick it up, throw it in the sharps container, and go get another one. <laughs> but it's like, how did that just happen? <laughs> Especially with the supervisor standing right there. That's, that's usually my case. Um, and so, let's see, what else? Um, so the doctor is going to insert the spinal needle of their choice into the back. Oh. Uh, the, oops, sorry. The doctor is wearing gloves. How are your doctors with that? Do you know that all their glove sizes? Yes. Yes. Is that important? Yes. Do they get irritated if you don't have the right size? How do you know what size? We have a chart. We look. You have a chart. You look yeah, it up. For each doctor. I know, right? Yes. Do you? That's pretty cool. You know what? There's not a lot of things different <laughs> from when I was, you know, your age. Um, if you're not sure what size the doctor uses, then just l lay out several different sizes for them, or ask, ask them what size doc. What size do you, What size glove would you like? You know, but they like to have things already set up. Typically, they like everything set up so they can just come in here and minimize their time in the room. So um, make sure you have the right size glove. I have um, doctors will have them. One over here and one over by the tray so that wherever he goes, he'll pick it up and then he goes to the back and grabs the gloves himself when I have them. <laughs> oh, how funny. <laughs> He's like, used to getting his own gloves. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, if, if the area, um, let's say there's maybe a blockage in the lower spine and so they can't put the contrast media in there, there's another place where the um, Subarachnoid space is enlarged where they can insert a needle, and that's at the um, uh, cisternal magna. Um, at the bottom, at the base of the skull, there's a big pocket of um, subarachnoid space, and so they can go in there. I've done a lot of these, and I have never seen them use that method. So I, it is a method. It is not a common method to use. Um, so, um, of course, they'd have to shape that area, prep it, insert the needle. And again, the cerebral spinal fluid is withdrawn, same thing, and sent to the lab, and the contrast needle is injected. So, um, the other one is a sacral hiatus. I don't have a skeleton in here, but when you did your um, sacrum, there is the sacral canal, and the needle can be inserted through, um, from below L, um, the L spine. So um, the needle is inserted into the sacral hiatus. I, again, I've never seen that one. But those are some options if insertion into the lumbar spine cannot be performed. So what lab tests are done? Usually um, red blood count, white blood count. 
Yes. Uh huh. Yes. And they're pretty. They're pretty easy. Um, if you have an increase in red blood count, that means there's some sort of bleed, some sort of hemorrhage. White blood count is you now increased uh, chance of infection. Um, they can test for protein levels. If the protein level is high, that could be an uh, indication of a brain tumor. So they, they'll want to test for protein. For sugar level, a decrease in the sugar level could in, indicate meningitis. Um, and then a, a VDRL is, um, if, if they want to do that one, if they think there may be a case for syphilis, um, then they can do a VDRL. So the doctor may do all of these, or just a couple of these, or whatever specifically for the patient. I don't know. But usually that's, up, is it up to you to determine, not to determine, but to, how do you let the lab know what tests need to be done? Do you fill out a form? Isn't it usually on the order? Is it on the what? Don't you, isn't it usually entered when you bring in the blood thinner? I don't know. That's that's what I'm asking. Because I had a piece of paper that said, you know, the, I think it's supposed to be stickered, like on the on okay. the specimen. So you have, um, like, like you said, it'll stickers. it'll say one, two, three, and four. Then the, there should be a sticker. Okay, I, I think. who makes the sticker? The tech, I think. Does. Okay, so do you type it up or yeah, write, just write it? Just write it. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you know one, two, three, or four? Because it's already ordered in the system. Okay, so you do see it in the system. Okay, so it's already input from the from the radio from the radiologist, I guess. No, from the prescription, yeah, so that's like how much we'll gauge and how much CSF we'll pull out as well. Okay, so the referring physician will, yeah. if yeah. they want mm -hmm. all of those, then they're going to pull out more versus if they just want one or two, they'll pull out less kind yeah. of thing? Okay. So if you need five, five cc's, you take eight or nine, Okay. just in case. Okay, so the doctor takes out, I mean, yeah, the radiologist we, takes we out. We tell little. them, hey, get, get nine, ten, and okay. then... Okay. Yeah, extra, yeah we have we have three um, vials. Do you ever have to get any more? Uh, test. Okay. And then they have it's so cute. Look on the tray they have them where you can set them up for the radiologist, so they don't have to fumble. Oh, and here I saw this one time. This I had one doctor do this, and it just drove me nuts. But I didn't, of course, about the second thing. So the spinal needle. The thing about a spinal needle is it's um has a stylet, so you have the long needle. And then you have the, uh, the stopper, basically, is what it is. So, um, so the doctor inserts the spinal needle into the spine, and then nothing comes out of it until they pull out the stopper. And then you'd think, well, those of you who've seen it know that it's not that way, but you'd think it would just come gushing out like blood, but it's very slow, right? So just little drops of cerebral spinal fluid comes out. So, there is some tubing here that can be used. Looks like I've got two of them. That the doctor can put here. So there's a little bit of flexibility, and then they can put this in into the tube and let it let it drip in. And sometimes it's slow, and you're like, um, and so then they may do a little bit in each tube, is how whatever their preference is. I had one doctor do this. I couldn't stand it. So here's the needle sticking out of the patient's back. <laughs> and, let the, and let the fluid, you know, drip into there. And I'd just be like, oh. I'm looking at the patient like, and they didn't respond. So apparently it didn't hurt them. You know, but I'm thinking that pressure yeah. on the needle that. <laughs> That's how you do it. Who am I to say? So, um, how am I doing this? Um, you see what I'm doing? Don't ever do this. See, you can lead by bad examples. <laughs> um, I had the xylocaine on here and a syringe with needles to, with, you know, to draw that into the syringe. Have you opened up one of these yet? Yes. Do you use the gauze that is on here? I highly recommend using the gauze to snap that neck off because every time I haven't used the gauze, Guess what happens? I cut my thumb every single time. Mm -hmm. Every time. You'd think after two times, I would. You know, we had to do it like three or four because I'm like, Darn it, I can do it without cutting myself. <laughs> um, so here's this uh, larger syringe, again, for the contrast media that is being used, the Omnipeg or Isovue or whatever you want to use, and different needles. Um, usually they use the needles on here, except for the spinal needle, has been my. Um, experience. After the exam, they've got that betadine on their back. 
Mm -hmm. Y'all clean it off? Yes. Clean off the betadine, dry it, and then there's a nice little band-aid provided for you to, um, to use. Do y'all use that? Yeah. Do you clean your patient? Yeah. Clean your patient up? Okay, good. We use the dot, though. Oh, just around? Dot. Yeah. Well, just whatever, in, ca in case it bleeds and it doesn't get on their stuff. Oh, here's um, some stickers that you can use, uh, patient's name and number and <coughs> date and time to put on the test. Do you just use tape or do you, do you use this that comes with it? Yeah. Yeah, this. And so you just write on there and put it on there. So make sure your patient information is correct. So yes, know what each one of these indicates. What does VDRL stand for? Venereal disease. Something else, something else. Something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Who has a phone? Ms. Ms. Catherine, were you? Yep. I figured venereal, venereal disease, disease was the first one. <laughs> register. Levels? Levels? Well, I like it. Research <laughs> laboratory. Uh, <laughs> research laboratory. Thank you for looking. Is it is venereal disease? Mm -hmm. Um, so the equipment that you need for this exam, of course, is your fluoroscopy. Get in the habit of this if you're not already in the habit of it. You need to make sure your fluoro machine works before you bring the doctor in. The doctor in or the patient, the patient in before a needle is inserted, before an enema tip is inserted into the rectum, before any of that. Just and I've done that. I have turned it on. It works. I get the patient in. We get started, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, Did you test it? Yes. I don't know how it happens, but you minimize the chance of it not working because that, that's no fun, and I've had that happen several times. So you need a, this is where you need the table tilted in both directions. This is your exam. Um, this is why the table tilts with the head down. And did you, didn't we take rides last semester on the table? Mm -hmm. uh, if not, feel free to. Um, it will, <laughs> the table will go, if this is the foot of the table, it will go 90 degrees feet down, head up. Oh, yeah. Um, but it only goes like maybe 30 degrees head down. We do have the shoulder harness that clap, clamps into each side of the table. And um, so when the table is tilted head down, the patient doesn't slide off the table. So we do have um, security for the footboard and the shoulder um, security. Um, so you have your fluoroscopy unit, myelogram tray. We do use the grid. It is the lumbar spine area typically. Um, and so you're going to use um, the grid in the um, power. Um, your labels for your test tubes, uh, any markers that you need to write that down, or your lead markers also. Do you use your lead markers when you're doing fluoroscopy? We used to put ours up underneath the fluoro tower. Do you do that still? Okay. Um, so yeah. the doctor will know right to left. Yeah, I can show you that in lab. So um, a lot of times I would just stick my... Uh, left marker um, on the tower that comes across, stick it up there, and then when the doctor starts to fluoro, they can adjust it, move it out of the way. But it just keeps the radiologist knowing which side is left and which is right. And they may not even need that. That's just something that we did. Um, and then your uh, harnesses, um, any folded house, whatever they need to lay on. We had a bolus made. It was like a towels with a sheet and tape wrapped around it so it was a hard bolus to put underneath them to get that back arched. So, you know, pillows are sometimes soft and that doesn't really do the job, I, I don't know, but you need something to, to get the um, back arched. I, I provide a waste basket, as I said, close by. They don't always hit it, um, but um, try to get that. Do they, are they standing or seated when they do this? Standing. Standing, okay. Um, a pillow, maybe, maybe for the patient, um, and um, that's what I'm saying. If, if they sit, they'll need one of those stools with the wheels on it or not. And then, of course, there are sterile gloves. Uh, any other needle, like I've talked about, any other spinal needle, needle other than what they use for the uh, on the tray. So positioning is pretty basic. The patient's on their stomach, right? So the doctor's just going to probably take all the images that they need from that position. So um, usually the PA and then maybe both anterior obliques. You know when we do our lumbar spines, 
um, this normal spine series where they're usually on their back. Well, on here, they're typically on their stomach. Do they turn them on their backs during the procedure? Because the arch of the back is hyphotic, if they turn them over, the contrast media is going to run either down on each side of the lumbar. So staying on their stomach keeps the contrast media in that lumbar spine area. So usually they don't turn them on their back. So you're doing um, anterior obliques um, and then maybe the cross table lateral. Do they turn the patient onto their side? They may, I don't know. I don't know how you would get a lateral. Do you take any overhead images after the exam? You can move the, the, the two, two Okay, so you position. move to okay, so you move your four oh two to the lateral position, like yeah. a C arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, same? No, we usually just do the PAs and then we just watch it climb up the spine. Okay. Yes, and that's what the doctor will do under fluoro is um, tilt the patients. <coughs> um, so they're typically prone, if this, my hand's the head and my elbow would be the feet, they're typically prone or they may even have the head elevated a little bit to get the contrast media down in the lumbar area. Then as they want to look at the T-spine and C-spine, then the head is tilted down. This is what's important. When the contrast media starts going up the T-spine, now you've got a, what did I call the lumbar spine? Lordotic. Mm -hmm. Lordotic. I don't know if that's what I said. Convex. The, um, the T-spine is kyphotic, so the contrast media is just going to run one, you know, run over the back. No, so okay. we don't really do a lot of imaging of the T-spine. They can with fluoro, of course, um, but top overheads no. And then, then the contrast media, they can tilt the head a little bit more and it go into the C-spine. This is where it's important to keep the head back, the chin up. So you may have some folded towels to place under the patient's chin. So now imagine their head is down, they're on their stomach and you have their head on towels and like i said their head is down this way the having the chin <coughs> up brings the back of the skull and pinches off the spinal cord to keep the contrast media from running up into the ventricles so you either need to help the patient or give the patient instructions put that towels underneath them you don't want them to do this because then the con when, with their head down contrast media will go up into the ventricles and the exam is over with at that point. So um, again, we're trying to keep the contrast media out of the ventricles. So um, these are overheads that are that are done, but typically your um, radiologist will do these under fluoro. So we're looking at all of them. Um, we did sometimes we did the right lateral cube and the left lateral cube cross table. Um, also, so it just kind of depends on what your doctor wants. But this is what we're looking at. Do you see the little L right there? Mm -hmm. This is best just labeling it. So when they do spot images, they've labeled the side of interest. So, uh, I mean, are labeled one side or the other. L could be here or right there. I would use my regular marker so you'd see, you know, an L with my initials or whatever. Um, or if you have a little one that's maybe not so obnoxious, you could just tape it up underneath floral power. So again, you're looking at the screen. So the contrast media is dark. Um, and again, looking at you can see some of the nerve roots coming off and looking to see if there's any impingement on the subarachnoid space by the spinal cord. Uh, here's a cross table. So the doctor would leave the patient in the position, and I'm talking about the position as far as the table tilt, as to where the, they want the contrast media to settle. So if it's like towards the feet a little bit, that means the settling in the lumbar spine versus uh, head down more C-spine or T-spine. So um, I didn't have, at this point, you don't have to worry about the patient's head because the contrast media is going to be in the lower lumbar spine. So this is a cross table um, uh, lateral that, um, that we do. So you have the footboard on, always make sure that that's secure um, during that. That's our x-ray tube, uh, Katie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, yeah, kind, is, that's is, the kind we use at the hospital right there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> and here's, here's the lateral again and, and showing the contrast medium. Here's some obliques using this. Is now these are overheads, so we're not looking at a fluoroscopy image. We're looking at radiographic images. And you're looking, again, for uh, any impingement. I don't know that there are any here. Notice the close collimation. When you're using contrast media, you really want to bring out that contrast, and so 
um, closed collimation at, and also for detail. You can see some of the nerve roots coming off uh, the spinal cord there. Here's another oblique. Uh, here's the left lateral decubitus. So again, patient, uh, she's horizontal. They've got her head propped up. Um, going across the table. Um, thoracic um, positioning, I have done a lot of these 